So community-based interventions uh, encompass a range of things that happen at community and household levels. So at the one end, they could be just simple interventions that relate to supporting communities, women as well as men, in organizing themselves around support groups and uh, creating the environment where people have the ability to sit together, plan, prioritize their own problems, and sometimes work on indigenous solutions. Then you can add on to this a layer of outreach workers who are frequently people selected from the very communities themselves, who uh, then work with those communities to implement simple preventive, promotive interventions. Things like educating women how to look after small babies, how to look after their own health and nutrition during pregnancy or during reproductive age. And then in an increasing level of complexity, there are also challenging interventions to layer on top of all of these therapeutic interventions, things that you can actually do for illnesses and also for curative services where people do not have access to alternative methods or traditional health services. So this entire potpourri or what is now called community delivery platforms includes a range of uh, promotive, preventive, uh, supportive, and uh, rehabilitation services. So one big challenge that we have at hand in Pakistan as well as in other geographies is how could you optimize the mix of interventions that are delivered by these services and also do this in a manner that this is not the ceiling, that you use this as a transitional step as you develop much more sophisticated linked health systems with the link between primary and secondary care. These community platforms and programs have played a hugely important role in firstly creating awareness in Pakistan of the inequities that exist. Secondly, in creating the confidence within the policy framework that interventions could reach people who would otherwise be very difficult to reach. And thirdly, create the opportunity for integration that all of this space around community delivery platforms that has developed is also an opportunity to integrate other traditional services. So I'm fairly confident that this would be a game changer in many ways in improving health, nutrition, and development outcomes in Pakistan. But I think the, the most important, and perhaps the one that people are more, most fascinated by, uh, focus of these community interventions and uh, delivery strategies is the ability to reduce the inequities, the equity gap, so to say. So for many of the interventions, particularly those that relate to interventions around uh, maternal health, newborn health, uh, it's very clear that the gap between the haves and have-nots, the gap between the rural and urban populations, even within urban populations, between those who live in urban slums and in uh, other well-privileged um, uh, locations, the gap is huge. And to reduce that gap in a reasonable period of time, these community strategies or community-based approaches are the most cost-effective, expedient, and uh, uh, well-recognized way of doing so. And that's the attraction of these two policymakers. In Pakistan, this realization is relatively recent, and it stems from the economic realities that the public sector can only provide services to about 20, maximum 25% of the population and the rest are people who have to depend upon uh, their own resources and out-of-pocket payments to access health and health care. And increasingly as we get on to this uh, call for action and uh, scaling up of uh, strategies and interventions, uh, not doing this with public-private partnership uh, is just a, no, a non-starter from economic uh, uh, considerations to also community demand perspective. Uh, there is clearly a recognition at the, uh, the level of households and populations that quality services are sometimes not available within the public sector space. So slowly and steadily the government is also recognizing that where it does not have its own writ and application, as in some very difficult rural populations, if it did not work with uh, NGOs, and uh, other organizations who have a presence there, it would really not be able to implement anything. Also, the development partners have been instrumental in uh, encouraging the government to go that route. So today we have a much greater presence 
of the non-state sector players. But having said all of this, you still cannot take the state out of its responsibility for primary care. So particularly in the areas that I work in, in the health of women, newborn infants and children, the basic services have to be provided by the state. So that's an area that we have worked extensively on. So there are traditional and scientifically proven ways of looking at some of these outcomes, which on the quantitative side mean that for the outcomes that you and I are interested in, mortality impact, morbidity impact, does it impact on process pathways, hospitalizations, care, and, and uh, curative services? Do these interventions all equate? Uh, do they work in the same direction? Can you undertake meta-analyses to see their impact? And all of that work has been done. But sometimes these scientific methods are inadequate to measure some of the impacts of these community interventions that are more difficult to quantify. For example, how do you measure empowerment? How do you measure the fact that many of these community delivery strategies and approaches actually empower women with greater dignity? Uh, those kind of measures require an approach that has to be a blend of the quantitative and qualitative. Sadly, the information and data around that is much more limited than the quantitative side. But we are beginning to see assessments and we're beginning to see qualitative evaluations that encourage us greatly that these interventions also have the ability to reach, empower, and reduce some of the barriers around uh, uh, women's rights and status in society.